All right, y'all thought that I might be fibbing. This is proof right now. The Letterman Podcast. We have one sponsor, one sponsor only, but it is Rupert G and the Hello Deli. Thank you very much for sponsoring our show, Rupert. It's my honor, Mike. La 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 la. Welcome to the Letterman Podcast. Uh, this is an exciting one. Uh, Bill Carter is coming on the show. I had a uh, a top five uh, at the beginning of this endeavor, and Bill Carter was on that list. Um, and I'm going to tell you this. He's still on that list, actually. He really is. <laughs> um, man, okay, I'm going to get to Bill in a second, okay? Uh, first off, though, uh, at the time of this release, we are right around the beginning of April 2023, which means our one-year anniversary is coming up. In a mere 20 days, uh, April 20th of 2022 was when we started. Uh, we started intentionally on that day because it is the anniversary of uh, that year in 2015, or that date, I should say, in 2015 when that happened, my encounter with Dave, the New York Times, all of that crap. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about that. I, 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 <laughs> the, I, I had a, another podcast host this week ask me, um, if this show has uh, met the expectations that I had for it at the beginning, and I got to tell you, it's actually exceeded it significantly. Um, I'm really, really grateful. And we're going to be doing some anniversary stuff. So here's the deal. Uh, we're going to be doing some giveaways. Uh, we just went over 500 subscribers on YouTube. We've got more, lots of people. It's like three to 5,000 people who will listen to this through all the program, uh, through all the uh, platforms that this podcast is on per episode, not per episode, like for, for, for the bigger ones. Um, but YouTube is, is where I want to really try and, and bolster some more support here. We just went over 500 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, so we are going to, in the Facebook group, start giving away some stuff. One of the things that we're going to give away are some of these late show with David Letterman rejection postcards. This is a rejection postcard to somebody who has applied to be on the late show and uh, was given the, no, nah, no, nah, not so much. You know, thank you for submitting your interest in the late show with David Letterman. Unfortunately, we feel that an appearance is not quite right for you at this time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Rejection postcards. Kind of cool. We're going to, we got a few of these that we're going to give away. Uh, I've got a couple scripts that we're going to give away as well. Also a late show windbreaker uh, that you only got if you were on staff no, at the present, there's no chance that I'm going to give away one of my Letterman, um, you know, the, the 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 Letterman jackets. But we do have some cool stuff that we're going to give away. So now that we've gone over 500, um, I think we're going to start around the anniversary time giving some things uh, away. So please join the Letterman Podcast Facebook group. That is uh, one of the primary ways we are going to get entries into that. So um, exciting. Happy anniversary to the Letterman Podcast is coming. Uh, got a couple other special things planned that we're not even going to talk about. Um, yeah, just very, very grateful for this show, uh, for the people that, uh, we've met and gotten a chance to talk to and, uh, some of the stories that have come out now, speaking of which, oh, before, okay. Before we get to bill, um, Rupert G and the hello deli, it's getting to the end. The Hello Deli is up for sale. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what kind of transition is going to be there. We're not sure what's going to happen after that. Uh, Rupert has the uh, only is the only place to get Late Show with David Letterman merchandise, mugs, t-shirts, all sorts of cool things, and Rupert t-shirts. Like I don't know how long it's going to be, but soon he's not going to own this place anymore. And the end of an era is coming. Uh, grab grab your stuff. Go to hello-deli.com to grab your stuff uh, while you still can. I promise you there will be people who will regret. People four or five years from now that come back and watch these episodes uh, of, of the Letterman podcast and realize, oh my gosh, I could have gotten uh, some cool Rupert stuff or some cool Late Show with David Letterman stuff. Go get it right now. Hello-Deli.com, our one and only sponsor. And we, Rupert May, we love you so much. And we're so grateful for the last 30 some odd years. Um, man, you guys have, have really, uh, it, it's quite a remarkable story. And I hope that 
Um, I hope that there's some uh, some markings of the occasion. I hope I hope there's a full documentary made about you guys. I really, really do. I love you both very, very much. Thank you for all the support that you've given to us. Um, yeah, so much love from the Letterman podcast to Rupert and May at the Hello Deli. And we'll throw Irene Hoffman in there too, because we love you too, buddy. Uh, appreciate you so, so much for everything that you do. That's uh, Rupert's, uh, Rupert's gal. Um, Bill Carter. So... I don't know how many times I've read The Late Shift. It's a lot. And The War for Late Night, there's a line. Oh, my gosh. In this podcast, uh, I am so excited. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I'm always excited. But um, being able to hang with Bill Carter, whether or not he was just being gentle on me or I was actually hanging with him. And, 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 and that is something that I have always wanted to do. I've always wanted to hold a conversation with him. I'm going to flat out say this. I hope he comes on this podcast a lot more. I hope I have a lot more opportunity to interact with this man. He's talking about um, what's happening in his career. He talks about that in this, in this episode. Um, you know, his CNN contract is ending. He says, as he put it in a few short months, he's going to be putting a shingle out there. Boy, would that be fun to figure out a way to interact with this guy more than just about Letterman, but about, the entire genre of late night, which he clearly loves talking about and is nothing short of perhaps the foremost expert on the planet of this uh, form of entertainment, this genre of entertainment that we love so much. Um, I, 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 I'm so grateful that I got a chance to have this conversation with him. I hope that there are many more down the line um, because it literally the tip of the iceberg when, when, when Don and I finished and Don was there the entire time, but I, I, uh, he, he kind of just enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know what? I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm pretty sure he enjoyed the conversation and he just kind of sat back and, 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 uh, um, but anyway, one of the things that Bill Carter said was, uh, you know, there's the late shift. Uh, we talked about the movie, uh, very cool story, some behind the scenes stuff about the movie. Um, he talked about uh, his conversation with Johnny Carson, uh, which was um, entertaining to say the least, but to watch Bill Carter, and I don't think I'm being hyperbolous by saying this, get as excited as I get about this shit. <laughs> During that part, I mean, and I was cheering for him, and it's 30 something years after the fact, but when he had this conversation with Johnny Carson, it was so, um, it was so earnest, and 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 to hear Bill tell these stories, and 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 of course we talked about Letterman, of course, but um, the War for Late Night, and and his quote, and boy, is he right? He wrote the hell out of that book, The War for Late Night. If you haven't read, if you've only read The Late Shift, you haven't read The War for Late Night yet, you got to read it. Is there going to be a third book? We talk about this. We talk about. All sorts of stuff. Um, and not for nothing, but uh, I think we mentioned it in the podcast or it was mentioned maybe before the camera started rolling. Um, but just uh, to be aware, we're going to do a shout out to Robert Morton right now, to Morty, um, Dave's former EP. And, uh, you know, he was the inspiration for The Late Shift. And, um, you know, Morty, we appreciate you so, so much. I hope to get you here to have a conversation um, sooner than later. And, uh I just, yeah, I appreciate um, Bill so much for giving of his time to do this. You know, I I, I, uh, I don't want to go too long on these intros, but uh, Bill Carter is a guy that I have read that book from cover to cover so many times. I wouldn't do the intro with him on camera because he would just fall under the table with embarrassment. Um, I appreciate him so much. And uh, it was a literal dream come true to talk to him i hope that we can do it again um you know i would love to do an episode with him on craig ferguson we did talk about peter lasalle a lot uh which i'm grateful that we got a chance to do and and it, you know he had a he had a, a an appointment um and i and i really feel like this would have been one that would have went two three hours if if he didn't have a, a kind of a a heart out as we like to say but it doesn't matter i i it was um it was so sweet and so great and every bit uh, they say don't meet your heroes, right? I, I have not had a situation in this experience with any of the people, whether it's the writers or the producers, um, you know, the musicians on the band and people who have written about Letterman, uh, the foremost writers, of course, you know, um, Zinneman, uh, appreciate him so much. Scott Ryan, of course, big friend of the show. 
the show, you know, might not exist without him. And then, of course, Bill Carter now can be added to that list. Um, God damn, I'm just real grateful about this. So I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> um, we uh, will now present. The Letterman Podcast is proud to present author, um, reporter, and uh, expert on the genre of late night, Bill freaking Carter. <laughs> Get it. <clears throat> Bill, this is a huge honor for me. Um, I'll talk about how many times I've read the books and, and, and things like that as we go through this, I'm I'm sure. But uh, I just really, I'm, I'm, I'm so curious. Um, the Late Shift, uh, what was your, okay, what was your position when you wrote The Late Shift? You were with the New York Times, right? Yes, I was the chief uh, television reporter for the Times. I covered okay. television. Um, when I read, I've read that book many, many times, and I, 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 I've wanted to have discussions with you about the business of the original Late Shift um, for literally since I was 20 years old. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm 47 now, so um, I, I've, I, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to do this. I want to talk about the business of late night. I want to talk about the state of where late night is now, because I mean, at the end of the day, even reading the Late Shift now, you can kind of see the tea leaves. Um, never mind the war for late night, which, uh, you know, talk yeah. about 2010, but you could kind of see the tea leaves of the dilution of what was happening, what was uh, very, very, very exclusive and became less yeah. exclusive and and then more and more and more and more to the point now yeah. where it's like, well, is it even going to be the same thing? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a person on the planet more qualified to have this discussion than with you. Well, uh, it's interesting you mentioned it 27 years because it's hard to imagine that's how long it's been. But <laughs> so. Is the late shift, um, I, I, you know, obviously there's been a lot of great work before then, uh, you know, Desperate Networks and, 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 and of course, Way for Late Night and other things that you've done. And, and never mind all the reporting that you've done. But I look at the late shift and, and when you look back at your career, is that definitely one of the high water marks or is it one of the high water marks that just people know about? I would say... Here's how I would define it. If the New York Times does an obit of me, <laughs> it will be in the first paragraph. Okay, there you go. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was it's something that uh, that we all who 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 love uh, talking about and nerding out to this nonsense of, of late night and 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 the characters within. Um, it's certainly, if it's not the Bible, it's certainly one of the holy works uh, of that. When you wrote that book, I get the sense, um, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm quite a voracious reader, but I'm an avid reader. And I love when I read a biography or when I read a book written by a reporter on a subject, um, when it feels like the reporter or the author is fighting back enthusiasm in order to stay uh, logical or true or 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 or, or non biased, um, you're a fan of this stuff. You love this stuff, don't you? Uh, yes, I, I should say, I sort of came to love it more in the process because, I mean, I I was a viewer of late night shows for sure, but I wasn't a habitual viewer. I wouldn't watch five nights a week. Uh, after I did the book, I never missed for I don't know how long, and I used to I used to love it when. Letterman was on CBS, Lena was on NBC, John Stewart was on The Daily Show, and Kimmel yeah. was on at midnight because you could watch the start of every show pretty yeah. much. You had, to go, you, had to, you had to watch like Dave's opening, and then you might watch a little of Leno, and then go back to Dave. And then at midnight, you could watch Kim. I, I, I literally would do that. It was like <laughs> you know, parsing out the show. And you could watch the first five minutes of Colbert because yeah. it because it, the show started at 35. So that was a fabulous lineup. Yeah. You were literally the uh, the opposite of the no switching, no flipping. <laughs> no, I, no, I, I was um, flipping like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, man, this is so cool. to I, I love hearing that because I could feel that enthusiasm in the book, uh, in both books, for that matter. Um, and again, you know what? I, I, I said it in the intro, but I'm going to say it again. If you haven't read The Late Shift or The War for Late Night, uh, you got to get them. They are absolutely, in my opinion, um, well, pivotal reading if you want to understand the business of this 
uh, particular slice of entertainment, but even more so the entertaining, the behind the scenes stories that you got. Was it difficult um, getting some of these people to open up so candid? Like the candidness in these books is astounding. Um, and, and from especially from you think about a guy like Dave. Well, hey, man, I'm almost a year into this thing. And the culture of the people who worked for Dave, uh, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Hard to compliment these people. Hard to, you know, um, you know, without them kind of deflecting it, um, right. you know, and, and, and then notoriously private as well um right. so on that side but but really you got this kind of candidness in almost every single aspect of all of these different shows you reported on did you develop a trick for that or did you find that people were kind Here, of itching to talk about this stuff here's the huge advantage i had okay when i started the late shift i had i had been covering the machinations of dave versus jay succeeding yep. johnny in the new york times so i established some relationships already then I think it was Morty, Robert Morton, who yep. said to me at some point when I was just covering it, he, he said, you know, there's been a, so much of this in the press, but there's so much people don't know. There's so much people don't know that went on behind the scenes. And I was like, ah, oh, that sounds like a book. Okay. Yeah. And, and that made me say, okay, well, the, the advantage I have is that the, there are two sides here who want their story told. So, if you find out something about X and Y doesn't know it, <laughs> you can go back and forth. And that's really what happened a lot. Like you, they started to know that I was incredibly well informed about what was going on. And so they wanted to say, okay, well, here's what really happened in that, in that circumstance. And it made it advantageous to me because I was trying to write not a, a history book where you say, according to so-and-so that, I tried to write a narrative. It's a yes. story. It's a story. I'm trying to write a story. And so I want to recreate dialogue, right? And the only way to fairly do that is to have both sides of a conversation say, yes, you know, the Warren Littlefield and John Agolia came in my office they, and they said this to me and I said this to them, right? Yeah. So now I have what they, so I go back to them and they said, yeah, we said that. And then I can recreate the conversation. So that's that was my approach. And I, I felt very lucky that I had the people who they loved the story. It, it was so much a part of their lives yes. that they sort of liked it was therapy for some of it for them to get it out, you know. Oh, I can imagine it was. That's a that's a that's a great point. Yeah. I mean, there's all of this at the time. And again, I mean, we're, we're sitting here at the time of this recording. It's 2023. Yeah. And, and to bring it back to, I think part of the reason uh, we had Zinneman on uh, not too long ago. And, and yeah. I asked him what it is about um, Letterman uh, and, 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 and many of the people who are enthusiasts of, of Dave who get this almost like, it's almost like a cult like following. It's almost like the Grateful Dead or you know, the Rocky Horror Picture Show or, or, or whatever you get these, these programs that no, come out. It's and not almost it is an omen. <laughs> it is a yeah. cult following. Yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, and and he, I asked him about that, and he said um, he actually credited your book. He said one of the things he goes, "Well, if you go back to that time period, you could not. There was no periodical of any sort that you could get. I'm from Western Canada." It was in like page two or three of our newspaper. Like yeah. it was the biggest entertainment story. Johnny Carson was the biggest star in the world. Yep. And, and a lot of people, the reason the genesis for this show is the fact that so many people have forgotten Johnny Carson. And to me, you know, back in my formative years during the late shift, and that was Zinneman's, uh, you know, the idea of that was that when that all happened, it just seared itself. It branded itself into our brains. And, and the reason I, I started this show is because people are, they're starting to forget Dave a little bit. And I just don't want that to happen. I want to transfer that knowledge. That's why this show yeah. exists. Um, did it's you have side, any... This is a side point, but I want Please. to make this point. Please. This is an issue of Late Night. Late Night produced phenomenal entertainment, okay? Yes. But it's very topical. It doesn't replay very well. So you don't see a lot of that. Carson's shows have replayed a little bit, but they feel old. You know, yes. they feel old. The references are old, et cetera. So you have this kind of ephemeral art form that that was vivid, incredibly vivid as it first started. But unlike episodes, let's say, of I Love Lucy, 
right? <laughs> Which are, you know, a hundred years old. Yeah. <laughs> you you don't see them replayed. It's not replayed very often. And so, yes, Carson starts to fade. Letterman and Leno start to fade. You know, yeah. it's it because they're not they're not a presence for another generation the way you know repeats of cheers or 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 seinfeld especially look at seinfeld yeah still playing tremendously over and over again it this is a different art form that's a really good point and and um i i i appreciate that like it's you think about um i mean topical in the sense of i mean i think it's always been a rite of passage for late night hosts to make fun of whoever the current president is and they find something you know, whatever it is, whether it's Dave calling uh, President Clinton Bubba or, or whatever it is along the way, there's always things. Yeah. And they are kind of a time capsule um, when it comes to many of the topics and things like that. What I love about Letterman so much, and I think the Letterman channel, uh, which started earlier this year, it started yeah. uh, almost just a, a year ago, February of, of 22, um, as they're starting to open the vault of these these clips at, that are that are timeless yes. um you know the celebrity ones I, the ones i love too are the the celebrities who were just kind of up and coming at the time when they were doing a panel with yeah. dave and now they're gigantic like you th uh, lizzo's the first one that comes to mind you know she did her uh appearance on her very, very first television ap appearance on there um but some of the comedy pieces or oh, you could eternal. insert them anywhere yeah. in any time period and they still play. And that's the thing that astounds me so much about Dave's work. Yeah, no, no. And, and that, that's why his originality was yep. more valuable than Leno's ability for a monologue, because that's a tradition that you can see in every late night show. But what Dave was doing with original com comedy, especially in his first show, yeah. when it was just wildly off the wall stuff. And that's yeah. where the cult started because people saw that and like, well, who is this guy? What is this? You know, that was so fresh and new and you have massive influence then of all the comics that follow him. That is a unique thing. And so you, you do want people to see that and understand that that was a breakthrough. You do want that. But in general, history is not a big <laughs> topic. I love it. But in general, the young people are not that interested in history. And, you know, right now, uh, late night is not what it was. So there's not the avid following that it used to have. No, uh, without question. And and um, it really is a journey. Like, it is an evolution. Um, and, and it's a fascinating one to me. Um, there, there, I want to talk about, um, you know, the idea of the, of the tonight show and what, and maybe this is a good, good time as any to bring it up. Um, I go deep on this subject and I've tried to go deep on it with, with, with some people, I don't think there's anybody, um, I, I believe that in doing this, uh, I've been preparing for this conversation today with you talking about this. I'm so glad Dave didn't get the tonight show. Like with the, the benefit of, of hindsight, I am so glad he didn't get the tonight show because, we got to see in many ways this evolution play itself out. Like, how is this going to work? Um, you know, The Tonight Show was what it was, but it wasn't. It was Johnny. And I think your book was, if, if there was anything in The Late Shift, that it was Carson took his show and went home. It wasn't, yeah. you know, um, he wasn't The Tonight Show. And the idea that 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 anybody could replace Carson is folly. It couldn't happen. It just would not be possible to happen. Even if Dave didn't start the late show, the dilution would have happened. We were already starting to get extra channels. We were already starting to oh, get, yes. um, you know, the, the fragmentation that happened. Yes. But Dave moving to CBS, we got a chance to see the Carson deal extended. Dave walked into ownership. He walked into, um, you know, uh, the power of, of, of being able to kind of do whatever he wanted that Carson busted his butt for decades to get right. Dave walked into that in exchange. He of course gave CBS a franchise that they, you know, finally, finally something got to stay in late yeah. night. That wasn't the tonight show. Um, am I on the right track with this? Uh, no, of course. And I, and I've said many times in many interviews that if not for Dave going against the tonight show at that point was a monumental task that everyone had failed at. They don't, yep. it, it always, it always had failed. You needed this unique star to go against the Tonight Show and for a long time, for quite a bit, actually beat it. Yes. That is remarkable. And I don't think anybody believes that if Dave got the Tonight Show, that Leno would have been able to do that. He was not a star of that magnitude. He, and you can see it now as it's played out over time. 
very popular guy, big ratings, are, but not a star of that magnitude. And that's what you needed to build that new franchise. And once you did build that new franchise, once one guy did it, then you say, okay, what else can we do? How else can we make a, a, an impression lately? And that starts the Daily Show, et cetera, and all, and all of that. But I, I think you needed Dave to do that. And you're right in a sense if Dave had taken over the Tonight Show, the, he would not have been as free because he would have had, and one of the reasons he didn't get it was that he didn't kowtow to the authority of NBC. That's not what he, that's not how he was made. So putting him into that structure, I think would have been somewhat limiting for him. At CBS, it was like, I don't care. I can do what I want there. They don't stop me. I can do what I want. Got him into trouble sometimes, but sure. but he, but he was, a, he was a signature. He was the signature star of CBS. Yeah. That's who he was. And so he could do those things. And I just think the Tonight Show and the Tonight Show was a franchise. It was a franchise before Johnny. Absolutely. I mean, Jack Parr was a huge star. It was a franchise before Johnny. The host then makes it what it is, which is what Carson told me and, and everybody else. It's about the guy behind the desk. That's that's what it is. It, yeah. You know, who puts a stamp on the show, the host. But but if I ask somebody today, just a regular person, who's the host of the Tonight Show? Do you think how many people would say Jimmy Fallon? I, I mean, I think they will say there's a Jimmy Fallon has a late night show. Yes, it's a Jimmy. Uh, it's one of the Tonight Jimmys. Show? I mean, people don't know that. I don't think the people know that. Yeah, uh, certainly not to the degree that it was at not the time at of the late shift. And again, that's yeah. that's that's what I'm trying to impress the to to, to people who. Uh, my daughter in law came up to me once, and she you know she's 25 and sweet, cute little cute little blonde thing, it was so sweet, and she she told me about a comedy bit that somebody didn't she showed it to me i'm and i just looked at her and i'm like no 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 you don't understand and i went on one of don giller's uh clips i said this is lifted directly from dave and and how yeah. monumental it was everybody knew it at that point there was no um you know it was the water cooler there was no viral moments it was the water cooler talk the next day and things have drastically changed so 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 much and you know this is why we want to talk about this stuff um carson the biggest star of the world. You talked to him at that time. I'll get yes. back to the the business of late night in a second here, but you mentioned it. I gotta I gotta ask. Um, you're a reporter and a damn good one, but you're sitting with Johnny Carson. I didn't what, sit with him. I talked what's to that? him on the phone. It was the phone. Okay, the phone. okay. Um, Peter Lasalle, you sat with. Oh, millions. Well, yeah. Okay, we'll get to Peter in a second. I yeah. I. I vicariously i adore peter and alice just from the tales that people have told about them but Catholic. you're talking to johnny carson on the phone was it just one call or what did you talk to him multiple times well i talked to him multiple times during my career but for the book there was one incredibly amazing <laughs> phone call that i desperately needed to get and uh that, that's a story in itself if you want to hear that story yes I'll i do it. sir i would love to hear that well, here's the thing. Johnny did not want to get involved. He was an NBC guy. He was very close to Bob Wright, head of NBC at the time. They traveled together. They, they were very close friends. So he did not want to elbow his way into this conversation. He was clearly a supporter of Dave's. People knew that, but he didn't want to say it. He'd had conflict with Leno over her, his crazy manager, all of that. But he wanted to steer clear of it. So I really needed him for a couple of things in this, in this, especially I needed him to confirm his conversation with Dave, which was the ultimate conversation with Dave. I needed that really badly. Yeah. I needed his side of the conversation. I had Dave's side. I needed his side. So as a reporter, I, right? Like, like yes, I, I'm doing a narrative. I can, I can write the story and say, David Letterman says this happened. I can do that. But if both people tell me, I can just redo the conversation because now I have, the evidence of both sides. Yes. So I need both. Yes. So how am I going to get Carson? Well, I made an appeal to his lawyer, um, Ed Hookstratton. Yeah. The hook. The hook. <laughs> and uh and Hookstratton seemed to want to not necessarily help me, but to kind of be a player in it. Like he he liked being involved. And we had a couple of lunches at the grill in Beverly Hills, which was Johnny's favorite restaurant. Hmm. Just me and Hookstratton. And uh, and I basically you know was trying to see if he could, and he said, "Well, I'll ask Johnny, and it's going to be hard." And he, he wasn't making any commitments. And finally, he said, uh, "Why don't you uh, 
why don't you type up a list of questions and maybe I'll get them to Johnny and maybe he might respond to some of that if he knows what you want to ask. And I said, you know, so he'll send me back written answers. That's not really what I like, but it's better than nothing. Absolutely. So, so I had this strategy <laughs> because I thought I know one thing that may get Johnny's real interest. And that was a story that Dave told me. And Dave told me this story that about, I don't know, two, three years into his at late late night show on NBC, when it's when he's a phenomenon and he's on the cover of Rolling Stone and all of this is happening for him, he uh, he's in his office one day and his assistant says that uh, Johnny's then lawyer, bombastic Bushkin, Henry Bushkin, <laughs> has come to see Dave. And that was not unusual because the... Carson Productions had a very small piece of Letterman's show, like yep. 5% or something. But, and Johnny always paid, I mean, Dave played fealty to Johnny, always. So his lawyer's here. Okay, I'll talk to him. So Bushkin comes in. Bushkin sits down and tells him, we are so impressed. You're doing great. It's fantastic. All this tension, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we think, you know, we'd like to line you up and sign you up to Carson Productions now. We'll sign you up because then when Johnny does retire, you'll be in line to get the show. And Dave starts to wonder <laughs> about this. And he says, something hinky going on. Yeah. Does, does Johnny know about this? <laughs> and Bush says, well, no, I haven't discussed it with him yet, but I think this is a great idea for both of us. And immediately Dave was like, this is a fire. I do not want to be anywhere near. Yeah. And he basically says, well, okay, I'll, I'll put you in touch with my manager. Rollins, Jack Rollins, and uh, and you know you guys can talk about it. I, I I'm going to stay steer clear of this, but you know why don't, why don't we set up a thing? And then he leaves, and Dave tells his assistant, "Never let that guy in the office again." Basically, <laughs> <laughs> basically. So so I had this story right, and I thought, I wonder if Johnny knows that happened oh. because Johnny had by then had a massive falling out with Bushkin, and we said robbed him and all that. Yeah. So in my questions, I include. So I heard from Dave that there was this thing where Bushkin showed up and offered him the Tonight Show to succeed you, right? And that was one of my questions. And I had like, you know, I tried not to do too many. Maybe I did 10, right? That's not a question, Bill. That's a trail of breadcrumbs right there. That's <laughs> genius on your part to do that. Well, well I, I was desperate. I really wanted to talk to him. So <laughs> I so I sent it off to uh, Bush, uh, Hook Stratton. And Hook Stratton says... Uh, Okay, I'll get these to Johnny. Do not expect him to come back quickly. He may never respond. Right. He may say to me, uh, you know, tell him, you know, I, I like what he's doing, but I can't, I just don't want to be a part of it. Just don't expect much. Okay. And it, it may take even if he, if he does, it's gonna, it may take weeks before he decides on this. I said, okay. Lots of managing expectations. You're basically describing my life with this show right now, just so you know. <laughs> thanks. Anyway. Thanks. But basically, I'd say, yeah, I thank him for helping. And sure. And uh, in those days, I used to work from home every Friday. And uh, the next day was a Friday. And I was home and uh, in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, and my phone was not a cell phone. It was my line, <laughs> phone uh, rings. And I pick it up. Uh, this is Johnny Carson. Holy crap. You, you got to tell me about this Bushkin story. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Yes. On many levels, from a reporter standpoint, from a writer standpoint, but also from a, like, you can't not be a human when the biggest star on the planet calls you up and immediately starts wanting to talk shop. Like, of course, it was fantastic in every sense. So, <laughs> so I, I, I tell him that story and he says, you, you, you know how that guy cheated me. And all of a sudden I'm like, I, I understand that, Johnny. That's why I wanted to run this by you and everything. And, he, and I said, can I've got you on the phone. Can I ask you some of these other things? And he said, well, I'm really uncomfortable about it, but. So we talk a little and I'm pulling threads out of him yeah. in this conversation and he's, and we're going back and forth about, don't say I said that. And I said, okay, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we went back and forth, but I said, I really got to know about this conversation. Dave says he called you and he says, yes, he called me. But, and he repeats it word for word with Dave. I mean, it was, it was identical, identical. Yeah. And I was like, I, <laughs> and I, I talked to him for maybe 40 minutes, let's say. Yeah. And uh, I hang up the phone. And I'm upstairs in the office. My wife is in the kitchen making dinner or something. And I just said, 
<laughs> and she came to the bottom of the stand and she said, that was Carson on the phone, right? I said, it sure was. <laughs> Yeah, so that's how I got Johnny Carson. On the landline. You could have been mowing the lawn. You could have been getting groceries. Like, I like that's, missed him. Like, that yeah, was the I world missed. back then. Yeah, and, but and, I'll, and, I'll tell you, Johnny wants to know about Bushkin. He was going to hear. He was going to get to me somehow about that story. So, Oh, that is so, like, uh, that is, you were the, you were the, uh, the, the, the cat that swallowed the canary in that moment. Well, um, and that, that, that's a story of a lot of great reporting. You got to be lucky and you got to have something the other person wants. Yeah. If you have information they want, it really helps them to join in then. Well, I appreciate that. And it's, it, I think it's a good time to talk about, again, like, again, we're talking about two different eras or, you know, we've probably seen one or two eras in between, you know, then and now, uh, even as a reporter, I just appreciate the fact. And, and today, I mean, how much of today's reporting is based on rumor is based on unconfirmed you know so one uh you know uh, unconfirmed source, source yeah. things like that yeah. you went and sourced everything out in the classic way that journalists yeah. were kind of well, taught to do you had multiple sources for yes. these things here's here, but and i will repeat again there's a to me there was a huge difference between my reporting for the newspaper and my reporting for a book and and frankly that's why a book is better i mean you're you the newspaper gives you the top 10% surface of a story. Yeah. And that's all you can get in a newspaper story. But yes. if you report it out to like 20 people instead of three, yeah. then you get all that. So, and that's really what I was trying to do with the book. Now, if if that story had occurred while I was covering, uh, if I knew about it when I was covering just day-to-day -day stuff, I would have written it. I would have written it on the basis, oh, Dave got a phone call from Johnny Carson. I, I would have written it. Just on right. the basis that Dave said it happened, I would have said Letterman said he got a. This, this is how we made the decision. That would have been enough because it was a personal event. He yeah. could have told me that story, and I would have believed him. But in, in the form that I was doing, I wanted to get a, a, an actual storytelling going. So when people are reading it, it doesn't read like a newspaper. It reads like a novel, kind of <laughs> like. Right. And the best review I got for that book, and I got reviews my mother could have written, could not have written, and they were crazy. Over yep. the top, great reviews. But one review was, "It's written like a thriller," and I was yes. like, "Yes, that's sort of what I was doing. That was it, <laughs> kind of." Well, and 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 if okay, if uh, to go down that narrative a little bit, if you're writing it like a thriller, what we're talking about is basically the climax of the book, which is which is uh, Carson giving Dave the final, you know, um, yeah. nudge in his way, right, to go to CBS and to and get Dave finally like, saying, "I won't take this." really cockamamie offer yeah. from NBC to sit out the rest of Jay's contract before I get the show, which was a terrible offer. And he should never have considered it, but he was so crazed to get the tonight show. And people do not get that now. No, just as they didn't get it with Conan years later, Conan goes through the same thing. And the tonight show was this shining city on the Hill or something. And they really wanted it so badly. And, you know, it, in both cases, it it just was not worth it. So, anyway, I uh, I oh gosh, I I can't believe it. I can't believe I'm having this conversation with you right now. Um, I feel like you did that day when you were talking to Johnny because uh, you know, <laughs> you're you're the, well, no, you're the source of this stuff. Like so many of my viewpoints and opinions about this stuff came from that text, that script that you wrote. That it's just amazing. Uh, and, and by the way, even in the late shift, which which you know, the war for late night, I love that book so 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 much um, as well. Uh, a lot more players in that book, but the late shift wasn't just two players. It was you had Leno's, uh, and I feel a very fair uh, representation from Leno's camp of all the good, the Absolutely. bad, the ugly, all that Letterman's. Absolutely. But then you also had the network. It was also the network. There was oh, yeah. also Conan in that as well, and and some yes. other things. But you, yes. I thought. Here's the here's the compliment to your work. You have this encompassing uh, document that is written with a ton of behind the scenes network stuff and 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 network executives. I've met a couple actually, and 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 you know the attitudes and the egos and the the big all these things that you're negotiating around, and they gave you access and they trusted you. Okay. Awesome. You put out this uh, amazing work, uh, so amazing that HBO made a movie based on it. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. But, I mean, this amazing work, so amazing that 15 years later, whatever it was, 
when there's another cluster going on. Yeah, exactly. The <laughs> same network, different executives for the most part, other than maybe Rick and some of these other ones, but they also invited you in to get their standpoint. That must have been like, I don't know if you've if you've even thought about that, but to me, uh, every once in a while, I'll read both books, like I'll read them one and then the other. Um, the fact that Jeff Zucker gave you the same access after Warren Littlefield gave you that access, that must show, that must be very gratifying to you that you were fair and, and you did put out a, a, a very accurate work because the new regime was willing to, even though there's a lot of egg on their face, was willing to give you that same access. Well, you said the key word, the, the key word is fair. And, and I was again, lucky. I was at the New York times. I had access to them and every story I wrote, they would say, fair, fair, you were fair. And I would, I, cause I wasn't loading up on anything or anybody, I was being fair. And with the second book, what was interesting with the second book was that was not complimentary to a lot, a lot of people. There was a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. And they, but they all were willing to say, I read your first book. I know what, you, I know how you do this. You know, I know how you do it. I know you don't lean one way or the other. And and so I'll talk to you because they they all believed that I'd done the right thing in the first book. So it, it was able I was able to build on that. And I, and I think the first book I had achieved some trust. But the second book I, I had, I already had the trust. Yeah. And Zucker, I mean, it's just a unique story because Zucker, when he started uh, at, at NBC's Today Show and was a kid. I mean, yeah. 24 or something like that when he was first executive producer of that show. He became sort of a, well, he was a source for me, really. I mean, you know, we would talk. And, and I, so, and he absolutely trusted me. And, it, you know, he, we would call and just talk about his career and things like that. So I had a relationship with him. So he, okay. he knew That's that that would be, he, that book was rough on him. Very, very rough on him in a lot of ways, you know? Because he had to make decisions that were questionable. I mean, you know, he get he promises the show to Conan. He has to give the show to Conan and force Jay out and come up with this ten o'clock thing. All the things that didn't work. But when that book was over, he said, "Yeah, it was tough to read, but totally fair." <laughs> I was like, "Wow, what else can I do?" I mean, that's what I was aiming for, you know. And I managed. Here's the other thing: I managed to keep relationships with all the people that I, I can think of, except Kush, Helen Kushnick, of course. Uh, and they always said, you know, I can't say anything. But I mean, Warren Littlefield, you know, <laughs> who I have a great relationship with, you know, in the in the, uh, in the first book, he, there's a scene with him pulling up his pants from being on the toilet, right? Because <laughs> Jay calls him and he's like, that's very embarrassing. Absolutely true. <laughs> So I'm mean, like, I, you know, I, I just felt, okay, I don't have, you know, after the book, I, I wrote the book, I sent the first for people I sent copies of the Lacia to were Letterman and Lena. I sent them because they'd been totally open with me. Yeah. And I'm like, these are the big stars. I want them to see what I wrote. I don't want them to hear from somebody else. Here it is. And I don't know if they've read it. I really don't. I don't know. Uh, but he sent a beautiful note. <laughs> because Dave's a very courteous guy, very. Yes. And Leno, I was much more worried about Leno. Uh, he left a message on my phone because <laughs> I I deliberately didn't take the call. I was a little nervous about the call. <laughs> so, but he left a message, <clears throat> and it said something like, uh, oh, "Yeah, I read the book. Yeah, you know, so you did a great job. You did a great job, and uh, just make sure you get Lorenzo Lamas to play me in the movie." And there was no movie at the time. There was no, no idea about a movie. But that was, again, he was like, absolutely no problem. And he, and my relationship with him actually got way more deep because he then used to call me. I wouldn't say every day, but three days a week, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Say, well, you know, what do you think? What do you think? What, what's going on? What do you think Dave's been up to? And And then he would try monologue jokes out on me. Yeah. And it would say, ah, this one's a little edgy. What do you think? Does this go too far? And I, I'd be like, Jay, you can't go too far with me. You can't offend me. So I'm a bad judge for that. But, you know, it would be some Michael Jackson joke or yeah. you know, things like that. But, that, but that, this happened a lot. And we just, 
chat. We just talk all the time. So I was like, that's a that's a sign. I, I he feels like I was fair to him. He doesn't think I was out to get him, and I, that's all I was going for. That is a fascinating. Uh, I, I'm really grateful that you 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 uh, revealed that little part there because it seems to me, Mr. Leno. Uh, very, very much appreciates relationships, no matter what. Like, like you think about, um, and 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 also, but is very obviously strategic about it. Like, clearly, extremely strategic about it. When when the oh. when the dust up was happening, you know, he did something. What he just did with you, okay. Well, Bill Carter, he reports on this stuff. Occasionally, he writes a book on this stuff. Uh, you know, I probably want to keep that person um, in someone that I talk to. You think about what he did with Kimmel. Um, you know. Oh. And and very similar, like what when as soon as you started saying that, it reminded me Im- immediately of, of of what he was doing with Kimmel at the time. No, it's it, it, yes, but you know, he, because he wanted to have the ABC option at that time. Yeah, you know he he needed to have a situation where he wasn't now going to go to ABC and have another late night guy pissed off at him. Right, mm-hmm. it, it, Jay's a very sensitive guy, he, and he did not like being accused of you know, stabbing Dave in the back and throwing Conan overboard and all that stuff. He just wanted to be on TV every night. That's what he wanted. That's what he wanted. That was his goal. He he just wanted that. And if you want to fault him for that, you can fault him for that because it got in the way of other people's careers. But that's, that was his ultimate aim. And, uh, and he felt like the show business is that kind of world. You pursue your career. That's what you do. You're, you're expected to do that kind of thing. Um, and he also felt like, generally, he's a good guy. So people would understand he's a good guy. And he's a complicated guy. Jay is a very complicated, complicated guy. And everybody says that Dave is weird, right? Or something, right? Dave's a sure. weird guy. And Dave is very eccentric and quirky in a lot of ways. But I understand him. I understand Dave. Jay is hard to understand. He He's much harder to understand. He On the surface, it's simpler, but... There's stuff deep in him, and it doesn't. He, he doesn't reveal himself really, actually, much. Mm-hmm. You know, he he withholds a lot, um, and and I think you can get really deep into this. Both guys had mother issues. I mean, you can get very deep into this, but yeah. but which I didn't. I did not try to do a lot of. I thought it was important on a couple of occasions to deal with it. But yeah, you went there for sure. I I, I just don't think, for example, I never wanted to deal much with any of Dave's sex scandals or that. I had to deal with them somewhat because he yep. dealt with it on the air. Got to deal with that. Yep. But um, that's just not the kind of reporter I am. I don't care. I don't care about that. You know, that's, that's a, di- that's a different story. I'm writing about the entertainment side of it. Holy cow. Um, I just got goosebumps as you said that, uh, you know, when, when the genesis of, of this show, and I don't want to make it about this show. I want to make it about you because I don't know if I'm going to have another opportunity to talk to you. Um, but this show is positive. Like it's straight up positive. We're talking where it's a cell. Uh, the, the tagline is celebration of the greatest body of broadcasting work in history. That of David Letterman and company right. uh, period. Um, Dave doesn't ever have to be on this show for this show to exist and do really, really well because the company uh, that surrounded Dave, um, yeah. you know, as, as important as the host who happens to be the greatest broadcaster with probably the, the greatest wit, uh, you know, the, the, the six gun shooter of, 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 of wit ever. Great. But we are positive. We stay away from scandal. We stay away from that kind of stuff because we want to talk about the entertainment. And as you were talking about that, I went back to in the chapter, uh, still Dave, after all these years in the, in the war for late mm-hmm. night and, and you did report it, but you basically, and I mean, at the end of the day, any time, never, never mind the, the, you know, that particular one, but I think about Governor Palin, you know, um, you know, when she was on, by the way, there's Governor Palin's endorsement for the Letterman podcast right there. Oh, nice. Um, good luck with that. And that is underlined. I don't know if there's any uh, sarcasm there or there's, not. Yeah, but I think so. Yeah. <laughs> there's another example of, of, of when Dave would deal with controversy of any sort, scandal of any sort. Um he was so straight laced about it. And that segment after the monologue was my favorite for years, whether I had a good day or a crappy day, whatever. When I came home, 
The segment after the monologue where Dave was at the desk, and you so expertly said this in War for Late Night, sometimes there'd be a there'd be a blue card with a beautiful piece of comedy sitting there, and he would just ignore it because he Lord, just wanted yeah. to talk to the people. Mm -hmm. And 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 when controversy came up, I think he really rose to the occasion to talk about this stuff. And uh, I, I, he did an expert job at, at handling anything, which is why he didn't have a lot of lingering things that kept going after the fact. Yeah. But being positive, that's what your book was. It was it was written in a way that uh, it talked about negative things, but it did not sensationalize them in any way. Well, I tried not to do that. I do think Dave's communication skills were amazing, absolutely yeah. amazing. And, you know, people obviously credit him after 9-11 about that. But I mean, absolutely. he just would do that on, you know... When he would discuss the woman who broke into his house, for example, right? He felt very empathetic to her. He he did not want to hurt that woman. Yeah. Ever. He, you know, it was a source of some humor and everything, but sure. You know, and he was able to communicate that while also being entertaining. Yes. Um, the night of the scandal, uh, I was coming home on the train and uh Rob Burnett called me on my cell phone in the train and said, you need to know what happened at, at the taping today. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Talk about trust, Bill. Um, and I was like, I got to get home. I got to get home quickly. You know? And uh, uh, Because, I, you know, he described the thing, and I was like, oh, my God. But here's the really bizarre thing, is that the next day, the next day maybe, anonymously, someone who had been in the grand jury contacted me. Holy crap. Uh, have you talked about this before? Uh, I think I have, yeah. Okay, I've, I have never heard I this. I think I, I alluded to it even in the book, that he, how he was dressed at the grand jury or something. So I, I had a little detail like that. Oh, okay, like, okay. It was, yeah. it was only that. It was only The person didn't reveal anything that was of substance. He just said, this out of the blue, this guy comes in and you know, I, he said, for the first, I don't know how many, 30 seconds, I, I think I was the only one in the room who thought, oh my God, that's David Letterman. <laughs> you know? uh, so that was a little interesting, odd detail that happened. The person did not violate anything. No. Just, just said he was wearing a lumberjack shirt and looked disheveled or whatever, you know. Uh, but I thought that was interesting. And of course, it sort of, it sort of just fed that whole story of dave just saying uh, you know i'm being blackmailed by this guy i i can either hide the scandal or i can go blow the whistle on him and i'm gonna do the right thing <laughs> like, yeah it, it, it's gonna cost me but i'm gonna do it and i whatever yeah. else you think that was just kind of the admirable thing to do uh but it was just another interesting moment where i was sort of inside a little of the stuff that was going on there well, and I think I think in that you're you're I mean, I, I don't want to again, I don't want to paint an unfair picture against Mr. Leno. But you look at the way the two have uh, to the public anyway, presented themselves when trouble happens. Um, yeah. You know, for lack of a better term, Dave, Dave owns his shit. He, yeah. he, he owns it. And he and he and, and, and whatnot. And I don't know that I don't know that Mr. Leno can necessarily say the same. And that, uh, again, that's not criticism. It's just the way the two people. Yeah. They didn't have a lot of scandal like that. You no. Know, like, oh gosh, no. There and you can say Dave's a more interesting person. Right. A, you know, he has more things that have happened to him that are interesting. Uh, and Jay, I, I feel like Jay's a, a guarded person in a lot of ways. And I, I, you know, I don't think he's. And, and by the way, Jay's very generous guy. Very, Absolutely. Very, my my son is a stand up in L.A. And uh, when he first went to L.A., he said, oh, well, you know, you haven't come to the club. I'll, you know, I'll talk to him. You know, he he he, he was he was he, a, a very generous guy. Your son's a stand up. What's his name yeah. and how's he doing at it? Does he does he love he it? He performs as Dano, D-A-N-N-O, Carter. Uh, he don't. OK, he has a regular uh, show that he himself created at a, a place in Manhattan Beach every Monday night. And then he's done that for 10 years. That's been his main thing. But he's done a lot. He's doing a show. He's you know, he's been in Vegas. He's been in various places uh but he you know he, he, he just what he always wanted to do had nothing to do with me like <laughs> sure. really nothing at all to do with me but that's the thing he wants to do with his life it's 
and he enjoys it. It's not the best job in the world. It's very hit and miss, as you can imagine. Absolutely. But, but I, I, it's very interesting because I, when I did this, um, first a documentary series about late night, and then I did a podcast. Yes, did, with Mark. Right, Mark was involved. Um, yeah. Uh, and I and I won a Webby Award for that. Yes, <laughs> which was very nice. But one of the things I uh, got into, which because uh, because it fascinates me, is how important late night was to the careers of stand ups, uh, because that's where you you were exposed to to the public. You didn't have hour long specials on Netflix, you know, yeah. and especially Carson. If you hit it on Carson, it was magic, right? Very much so. And, and then, you know, Dave would do some of it and Jay would do some of it too. Um, I don't know that that's, that's not a venue really that works anymore. I don't, I don't know the comics break out really on, on late night in any way, the way they did, but what was no. fascinating to me, and I love this part of it, this is off topic a little, but when people talk to me, famous comics like uh, Ray Romano and yeah. George Lopez and Ellen. Ellen. I didn't talk to Ellen. El Ellen, by the way, I know very well, but she decided not to talk about this. But okay. anyway, they talked about their, they, a lot of them were long professional comics. They, they, they just it took years for them to get a shot. And when, and they thought, think, well, you know, I know people talk about getting paralyzed with fear the first time they do this, but, but I've, you know, I've done this for years, but they were paralyzed with fear <laughs> anyway. Cause it was like, <laughs> as Romano said, it was like jumping out of a plane. The curtains open. You walk out on the stage and you're out there yep. and you can't go back. There's no going back. You can't get back in that plane. You're out there. Yep. And, and I, you know, and he said, and, and I was done this for years and I thought oh, I'm going to be fine, but I'm like, uh, <laughs> so I love that. I love that. I loved how important that was in the, in the history of comedy. Uh, I think Ellen talked about that uh, extensively when she was on my next guest on Dave's Netflix show. I think she talked about her first Carson shot. Um, yeah. And, and, and I love that. And she was great. And she got invited over to the desk. So uh, absolutely. Well, well, and that's just it. And, and I mean, you talk about breaking barriers, uh, barriers that, that were even unrevealed at that point, but, but uh, Ellen, I, 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 I appreciate the contributions that she has made to everything. And, and, and somebody, um, uh, one of Dave's former assistants came on and, and, and we talked about it. She, uh, she works with busy Phillips now, but um, Casey St. Ong came on the show and she talked about Ellen and Fallon and how similar they are. I love the comparison that she made to, you know um, you know, we, we, we got into the topic of could a woman host the tonight show and be yeah. accepted and, and whatnot. And, and Casey without, I am paraphrasing, but she said, well, I think it's already happened, but it was a daytime show and it's Ellen. And yeah. how similar those two are as hosts and how similar the formulas are in those two shows. Yeah, but Ellen, it's very interesting that Ellen, and as I said, I really got to be very friendly with Ellen mm -hmm. because I wrote about her before her show came. She came to New York and she wanted to talk to me because she loved the book or whatever. Yeah. And we just hit it on. I, I used to talk to her for years. But uh, Ellen, I think, deliberately steered clear of late night and thought it was much safer for her to, to to break in daytime but let me tell you if somebody had put tina fey in late night oh yeah that would have worked spectacularly i'm in so, i'm it's, in it's, absolutely and I, I would say that for years it, it, tina if tina wanted it and pursued it and she would be great at it so forget this whole women aren't funny stuff <laughs> no oh gosh i well and i mean you know you you read the tea leaves of what's going on in late night right now and uh you know you think about you know lauren where he's at and there's there's rumors that are going around speculations and stuff. Some people are thinking Seth might move over to that position. I would love to see Tina Fey late night. Oh my gosh, and maybe yeah. do something quirky or crazy with it. That would be yeah. uh, to take it back. Yeah, I, to I mean, I, I I I do too, and I I've sort of written about it, and it, I I've, I've gone back and forth about whether she really wants to do it or not. I think it's you know it's a life changing thing to do that thing four or five nights a week. You, Absolutely. You life. So, yeah. you know, um, but I, there's no question she'd be great at it. I mean, I just think she's a ph phenomenal talent. So. Oh, she's one of my favorite uh, entertainers on the planet. Let's, let's right now, let's do a plug. If people want to read, cause I think we're getting a really good, um, you know, description of, of how your, your mind works and the type of writing that you do and, and, and where you are, are, um, are slanted in, in, in the things that you talk about uh, where, when people want to see you currently, where's the best place for people to see the stuff that you're putting out right now? Right here. 
This is it. Awesome. <laughs> You're invited every week, man. Uh, you want to make this a weekly thing? We'll do it. <laughs> I, uh, um, I have had a deal at CNN for the last four or five years. Yeah. Uh, and I've been exclusive to them in the sense that I, I get paid to be on the air occasionally and to write for their website. Yep. That's going to end uh, in June. That is, is ending in June. And uh, I'm at that point, I can't really pursue anything until that ends. But okay. uh, when that does end, um, I am going to, I guess, put out a shingle, I guess is how you say it or something. And, uh, and see where I can contribute something. Wow. Um, okay. Well, this leads to all sorts of other questions. Um, okay. First and foremost, standing invite. If ever you want to just shoot the bull and talk about any of this stuff, yeah. uh, cause I can go forever. I'm the energizer bunny when it comes to this stuff. And, and I would love to discuss stuff with you more and more and more, but I mean, oh my gosh, I hope that you have a podcast. I hope you have a show. I hope you have something where, where you can take this. I'm a huge fan of the transfer of knowledge. Um, and, and, and uh, I just hope that there is an outlet for you to get this out there. Now, I've heard rumors for a long time, and I think it was actually written that 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 it's supposed to be a late night trilogy. The books is that there's a third book coming um, at some point. I wrote because there was a OK, there was a I had a contract uh, that had another book in it. Right. Uh, a third book in it. And uh, I kind of noodled around a little bit about it. And I, I said this after I wrote The Late Shift, I must have had, I don't know how many meetings with publishers. They wanted me to do another book right away, right? And I yep. said to them, listen, I did The Late Shift because it was a book. I wasn't setting out to do a book. That was there. Yes. It was a story to tell. Yes. And as soon as there's another story to tell, I'm going to write another book. I guarantee yeah. you. But there wasn't for many years another story to tell that I felt was a book. Yes. And I did Desperate Networks, which was a bunch of stories, yep. which are very, to me very fascinating about the whole television business. And I have had a, a good time doing that. And then, of course, when they named, when they told Jay he was going to go to primetime and Conan was going to get the show, I in, instinctively knew that's a book. It was automatic. If, if Jay see. succeeds, it's a book. Not as good a book, probably. But if, if he fails, it's definitely a book. Because yeah. my view was, this is a bold thing to try this in late night. I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I don't good. I had that as a question. Not yeah. for Jay, not because it was Jay or anything yeah. else. But I don't think that's going to work. Yeah. I understood the theory, cheap, much cheaper to do that than an hour long drama. I understood that, but I didn't think it would work. And so in the back of my head, I'm like, and then there's Conan. Conan going to the Tonight Show. If he's a success, it's a book. If it's not a success... So I knew that. So I already had the contract when it blew up. So yep. there was a there, that was a book, and the publishers there loved it. They loved everything about it. They loved the way I did it, etc. And they wanted me to do another one. And it was like, oh, now we can do it when Fallon takes over. And Fallon, when he, he took over, you may remember it exploded. The yep. show really, absolutely, had, had it was. So I started to say, okay, well, let me start reporting about it a little bit, see what's going on. And, you know, it, behind the scenes we found that, you know, there's a story there yeah. uh, of sorts. Um, I'm already incredibly close with Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, mm. he's a fabulous guy and I've just had a fantastic relationship with him and I know Seth really well. And so I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm in place yeah. to do those things. But I then said, what is the story? What is the story? What's the narrative? I'm not going to just do, a, I need a narrative. What's the yep. story? And after, really after the Fallon thing happened with Trump and he started to fall off, his story changed so much that I was like, mm, it's not a story about him reinventing late night, you know, as the way it seemed to be. No. Uh, and I like Jimmy and he's a super talented guy, a yeah. very talented, talented guy, you know, but what is the story? So you know, I kind of put it off a little bit and the publisher was like, well, what about, and I'm, you know, they were very patient about it because I say, when I'm ready, I'm going to do it. When I'm ready, I'll do it. And then of course it became very focused on Trump and politics, 
you know? And I'm like, okay, well, that if you're going to do that, that's different. And you're going to have to report on that side of that. And, yep. you know, so the early stuff I did, I would basically, well, I would have to scrap that, right? You know, I'd already interviewed a few people. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then late night started to have this, you know, erosion, big time erosion. And I was like, I don't know that this is the story I want to tell. I don't know. So um, that has not happened for all those reasons. And, okay. and again, I would say, I have not committed to never write another book. I, as soon as I see the book, I write the book. I have to see it though. I can't make yeah. it up. It's very hard to do that. And I think you wind up with a, not a very successful book. Certainly not the kind I want to write because, because I want to write a narrative book. I don't want to write, well, we're going to get into the history of how you sell commercials on television. You know, that I don't, I don't do that. I don't want to do an academic history of TV at all. So no. No, uh, well, the, the, both your first two books, again, the feeling that you got for everybody, again, you wrote it like a thriller, like like War for Late Night, Jeff Zucker, you know, the, hind the, the benefit of hindsight, all that, the empathy that one would feel for Jeff Zucker after yeah. reading that, like I was empathetic towards him, even yeah. though he was painted the way he was, like all of that kind of stuff. So so I appreciate I want to say one thing from. if I can. Yes. Is that I talk, when, I'm t when I talk to people and I understand the late shifts, preeminence in my career etc hmm. but wow i think i wrote the hell out of the war for late <laughs> oh it's so I, good when i reread that so reason, i was like wow i really wrote the hell out of this book i mean uh and that was to me an amazing thing because i was writing it chapter by chapter we had a deadline i was writing it chapter by chapter and uh i i tend to be i the reporting is the hard part for me yeah uh because I, I, as I describe it to you, I want to get it, both sides of things. It's very detailed, takes a lot of time, can be yeah. very tedious. If I have it all and you drop it in front of me, I can write it relatively. I wrote the late shift in six weeks, start, start wow. to finish. I, I wrote it start to finish in six weeks. I had all the material, I had it organized in my head, and it was a, it was a energized story. It's like it just kept moving. So I, I, that I'm very confident I can do that, but the reporting is, you know, a chore. <laughs> so, I, I feel you. Um, gosh, I have so many questions. Reason, that have come I would say this. I just talked to the woman who's writing a, a bio, the biography of Lauren Michaels. Susan Morrison is her name. Awesome. She's from the New Yorker. Yeah. And she interviewed me for that. Um, Cause I, actually met Lauren the first year of the show. First year of Saturday Night Live, I met Lauren. But anyway, uh, and I thought to myself, I could have done this book. I could have I could have raised my hand and said, let me do a the a really big official biography of one Mike. Yeah. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's going to require you to interview hundreds of people, okay? Literally. And, and, and she's worked hard and it's taken her years and it's also going to be something you're going to have to, at least I think if you're going to do that well, you got to do everything warts and all. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you got to, and I don't know any bad things about Lauren Michaels, really. I don't. No. But, and, I, and he's been incredibly generous to me. But I didn't, I didn't know if I want to. I don't know if I want to do the biography form. That's different. I think yes. it's a different thing from the narrative story form, you know? So to me book writing is I, I always compare it and it's unfair to women to compare it to us but it's like giving birth okay yes right it's brutal and then you get this beautiful thing right <laughs> you have this beautiful thing yep that lasts the rest of your life yeah so you know that that's really what it's like but most people stop after just a few kids <laughs> absolutely um I can see that, you know, like even as you're talking about, you know, I, I could write a good biography about Lauren as you're saying that I see you looking at the process of what it would take and going, oh, like, like, like I can understand where you're coming from. It's that just, would be a, and I, believe me, she's probably going to do a better job than I would. I don't know. I, I just, I just saying I could have done that. And people have yeah. asked me, you'll ask me to do a, 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 a really formal biography of Carson. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, Again, I'm like, I don't know about biography. And it's been done. I mean, Bushkin wrote a book 
and it was unbelievably revealing, like crazy stories in there. Yeah. Crazy story. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't resist reading it, but I was like, wow, this is mean spirited stuff. Yes. But, um, and, uh, um, Bill Zemi, do you know, do you know the name Bill Zemi? I know the name Bill Zemi. Yeah. Well, Bill Zemi has written a lot about late night and did this pseudo autobiography that Jay did, uh, called yes. leading with my chin, uh, with him, but it's a huge Dave guy, huge Dave guy, actually. Uh, he got a contract to do the formal Carson book, uh, 15 years ago, maybe. Oh, wow. And did it i would hear all the time oh he's talked to the ex-wives and he's talking you know sally would say to me oh he's talked to everybody he's got he's got everything but he can't get he can't write the book the book hasn't come out and he's been through like three publishers he's got big advances and everything it hasn't come out and then he got very ill bill got very ill so that's he's recovered i think but that's how hard it is it's really hard and you know and i thought to myself i'm not going to start a biography of Carson, when I know a guy has done all the work and could publish any day if he really wants to yeah. and jump on top of your book. So all that, this has nothing to do with this other than my own, you're asking me what I'm doing and will I do another book? I might, as I said, do another yeah. book if one appears on the horizon. Well, I, I appreciate where you're coming from when you talk about the third the third book. There's a lot that we could go, a lot of rabbit holes. We could do half a, like, again, and I want to talk about Peter LaSalle. I want to talk about the HBO movie. I want to talk about yes. Helen a little bit, too. Like, there's okay. still stuff. I, I mean, there's so much meat on this book, Bill. Um, but going into the third book, I mean, right now, don't get me wrong, fascinating times when Dave retires. Scott Ryan, good friend of us, uh, of our show, you know, talk about that last six weeks. In my- Yes, I read my it. 47 years on this planet. My golden age of television is the last six weeks of the late show. Like it was the greatest run right there. Culmination of a run ever. I love that. I mean, there's so many things that you could talk about the idea of Colbert coming up, the idea of Colbert taking of, of late show, the successor to Dave going number one, but really again, and this is where the bigger narrative to me, I'm glad that you don't have it right in front of you, because to me, if you had it right in front of you right now, the title would be the destruction of late night. Yeah. Um, because mm -hmm. late, what does it mean to be number one now compared to what it was even 15 years ago? It's a completely different animal. The fragmentation is that we've, that, that you know, you've talked about in the war for late night. Um, again, you wrote the hell out of that book. Again, this is something else I wanted to say based on what you said, you wrote the hell out of that book because you had so many more characters I'm yeah. a huge Craig Ferguson guy. I love him so much. And you did such a good job talking about him, Kimmel, Stewart, all yeah. of the, like all of these extra characters. Um, it was so much bigger of a book in that respect than yeah. Late Shift was. And, and again, I don't know if it got its due uh, or not, but boy, you, you did, you wrote the hell out of that book. People I, liked I, it very much. Oh, it's so good. It's but so I want to say one thing though. Yes, sir. Uh, I would call it the decline and fall of the late night empire. But anyway, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, but I, better than the I really destruction of that's is, good. Yes, that remember when I started writing about this, Carson was dominant and Dave had opened the late, later period. And that was it. That was the entire landscape of late night. Was there was it? nothing, nothing yep. else. Yep. And within, I don't know, 10 years, there were nine shows or something. Yep. And, if you went, if you look at a world and linear television is the real issue because people aren't really watching linear television. They watch sports though. Yep. And they do watch some news though. If you were the only late night show, if the tonight show was back to being the only one, you probably have at least survival ratings. You probably have a decent franchise. Yes. But you can't have this many now. It's impossible. Yep. And I sort of lament the fact that so many people who work on these shows, look at all the writers who've been employed because of the, these shows existing. And, you know, I don't, I, I think the whole, a bigger story to me is if I was, if someone asked me when I write a book today, I would write a book called what the hell happened to TV? Oh. Because, because TV, which was a unifying cultural phenomenon yep. for my whole life is now a, completely dispersed you know world of <clears throat> like the a universe of tiny satellites or something <laughs> that 
very rarely intersect. I mean, yeah. and just small things like, you know, if you like a show, you 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 like a show like uh, uh, there was a show called The Bear about this guy who's a chef, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a streaming show. Well, terrific. People talked about it. Great reviews. Where They did eight episodes. Where is it now? There's The second season, it takes like 18 months or something to put on after they did only eight. You know, they made they made 13 episodes of The Sopranos a year. Yeah. They made 24 episodes of Seinfeld a year. Yeah. You can't make a better comedy than that. You know, it, it's, the, the world has changed so much in that way that you don't get this flow on my favorite shows coming back. And even when the show is really a, a success, it might run three seasons. Yeah. Nothing runs eight seasons or 10 seasons. So it's so different. It's so different. And I, I, I'm not sh sure it's better. I mean, a lot of the quality is very good, but is it better? Is this a better system? I don't know. That's a very interesting topic for me that, and, and may, maybe people would say, well, you know, it's, it's, you know, like talking about radio, it's, it's over, you know, TV is over. So there's no yeah. point in trying to recreate it, but it just is, I don't know that it's better. Television was better than radio. Okay. Cable was better than sure. broadcast. OK, uh, premium cable was even better than that. Is streaming better? It, I think, is a more open question. Um, anyway, if you write that book. I want to talk to you about uh, uh, let me talk to you about the movie. Oh, there you go. So, okay. uh, Don, that, you know, Don I, gave I us this here. The right movie. there it is right there, everybody. Yeah. I have that poster on my wall at home. Oh, that makes me so happy. I, OK, yes. thank you for segueing back to that, because. Yeah, again, I'm not going to have enough time today to talk to all the things I want to talk about, right. but 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 well, the I movie is definitely something. Because, because I wrote the movie, okay? I actually wrote this movie. And that's a story because I was, uh, maybe t two or three weeks after the book is promoted, my agent calls me and she says, listen, are you sitting down? And I said, <laughs> yeah. She said, we have two offers for movie rights. And two? I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. There was a, another guy had sort of an independent producer at okay. HBO one that, and I was like, "Wow, you know, like, yeah. this is fantastic!" You know, the whole concept of, you know, you write a book, they give you an advance. You never, it never really makes it to royalties unless it sells a huge amount. So mm -hmm. you think well, you, I made a good advance on that book <clears throat> by that terms of the in that period of time, but. Yeah. Uh, but the idea that now someone's going to pay me for movie rights, this is found money, right? And uh, so I'm all for that. And HBO contacts me and they're all big into this. And uh, you you get you get 10% uh, of the fee for your rights up for a year. And they option the rights. So it's 10% of what the fee will be. Okay. You get the fee on the first day of production. So it goes into development. If it goes past development and gets to production, that's when you okay. start filming, you yeah. get the fee. Okay. So to me, I'm like, I just want them to make this. Well, this, make this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh and so they asked me, what would I, you know, consult with them on it with the, when we hire someone who writes it and all that kind of stuff. And I said, Absolutely, I'll I'll be available to whoever for that, you know. Great. So they tell me that they're going to they brought in uh uh, Ivan Reitman, the the Ghostbuster, Ghostbusters, yeah, executive producer. He's going to be the executive producer, and I'm like, fantastic! Wow, <laughs> great. And Reitman contacts me, and he says, okay, you know, this is our plan. I want to get, I, I think, I want to get a writer director. I, I I think if we get a person with a real vision with a writer director, I'm saying, great, just make. And back of my head, just make the show. Just <laughs> and. Uh, Okay, that's great. So they then they let me know they've hired this guy, and I didn't know who he was, but they told me something he had made before, and I went and watched the movie that he wrote and directed, and it was very good. And I said, okay, I'm all for this. Great, let's go with this guy. So this guy then it gets the book, and he goes off supposedly to write it, and uh, months go by, which is fine, it takes a while. Sure. But then many months go by. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm like, what's what's happening with this? And there's a movie executive attached to the project, and he's like, I don't know. We're we're kind of wondering when he's going to 
turn in a script. Well, anyway, I think it was eight or nine months went by. Now, remember, I wrote the book in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking, what What takes, it's already written. Come on. <laughs> anyway, uh, but again, I'm just rooting for the guy. Come on now. Let's go. <laughs> so they, they call me up and they say, he's turning in a script. He's turning in a script on Friday and we'll send you a copy. I'm like, okay. great. And I say to my wife, I do not care how good or bad this is. I'm going to tell them it's great. Let's make it go for it. <laughs> Cause yeah. I, I want the movie to be produced. And, uh, and so they send me the script on, it was a Friday and I get the script and I start to read it. And I'm like, Oh, the first scene, mm, I, you can't really say this because there was a scene where both Jay and Dave get drunk. Okay. Dave, Dave, who is famously, uh, you know, is sober. <laughs> gave up alcohol. Yeah. Right. Right. Jay yeah. has never had a drink in his life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> He's never had a drink in his life. So I'm like, you, you can't do that. You can't mess with a guy <laughs> like, like that. Right. So I'm like, okay, that can be fixed. You just don't need to show that or whatever. Sure. But I'm reading it and it's very heavily influenced by uh, the whole Mike Ovitz part of the story. Like really, you no know, CAA getting. I'm, I'm like, this, this, it's just so not important and not that important. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, but it's in the it's in the story. But and I'm reading it, and I'm getting more and more like crazy. Like, how can I say, gee, uh, it looks good to me. Just change a few things, right? Yeah. How can I say that when I think, in fact, it's terrible. It's terrible. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I'm thinking, I got to talk to them on Monday about this, you know. So <laughs> I sat down at my computer. I was like, look, I'm going to write what I think they should start with, at least. The first scene should still be about Carson retiring. That's the yes. driving force of the. So I thought, you know, and, and I've written the book, so I know the scene and the dialogue kind of, and I don't have a format to write a script. I, I didn't have a, like the script writing format. So I, I was going to ask that question. So you've never written a script before Nothing. in your life. No. You're basically kind of looking at this script as kind of a, okay, this yes. yeah. format I've that seen way. Many, I've seen many scripts in the course of my work. So I know the sure. format, you know, the way you write a description of where, what the scene is, then the person is in the middle and you write the dialogue. I knew, I knew how to do that. But I had no format to do it. So I'm just using like the margins <laughs> and moving them over. And, but I'm, I'm thinking I'll write like five or six pages. And, you know, we'll see if that can help them, give them an idea of what it could be. Yep. So I sat there and I wrote those five or six pages. And I said, you know, the second scene really should be this. I, anyway, so in <laughs> that weekend, I wrote, I think, 60 pages. Okay. I, I couldn't stop. I Holy kind of like, smokes. Should be this. Now it should be this. Of course, this scene is where it comes in. You're invested. So, so I wrote that and I call the guy calls me on Monday, the HBO the guy in charge of the movie. And he says, so uh, have you read the script? I said, yes. He said, uh, so what do you think? And I said, I got to tell you, man, um, I think it's awful. And he said, well, we agree. It's completely, oh, good. completely unusable. Good. And I'm like, oh boy, there goes the money, right? Um, I said, well, listen, I don't know if this would be helpful, but I did sit down and sketch out what I think it should do, how you should do it, you know, and maybe another writer can just use that as a template to write the thing and hopefully not take so long because we're getting so divorced from the events. Dave's already on and doing great, you know, CBS is doing great. No, yeah. So I sent it off to CBS, to HBO, and uh, I got a call from the head of HBO, Michael Fuchs, the next day. And he said, I never say this. I never say this to people because I always say, stick to your day job, but not you. Whoa. This is what we need. You got you got to write it. I'm like, really? <laughs> I said, yep, you got to write it. This is it. This is what we want. So now I have this new contract that I'm going to Yeah, I was going to say, more money. Here comes more money. 
<laughs> I get I get I get paid to write it and then I get the fee when they make the movie. So all that was fantastic. And I wrote the whole script. I worked with Ivan. I went to LA and hung out for I think a week. I took a week's vacation. I went I went in the hotel and wrote like four or five drafts with him going back and forth. Great relationship, worked really well together. They hired Betty Thomas as the director. She brought me in on casting. It was like yeah. amazing experience. She brought you in on casting. Yeah, only only a few of the parts because she she really struggled with Dave. Really, really struggled with Dave. Okay, I think the guy was good. By the way, I, think I thought he, he I thought he was totally fine. What about Kathy? Yeah. Were you part of that, or was Kathy attached to it earlier? Kathy was no, she was in. They, they oh got her. yeah, because that yeah. was uh, that was the that was an part. incredible performance. Anyway, so you know that they make the movie. I get an Emmy nomination. Yeah. It's like crazy uh <laughs> wild thing happened because the guy didn't write a very good script but but the movie was you know i think a lot of fun i mean you know i think if people watch the movie now they'll still kind of enjoy it it feels very dated the way the television business is dated sure um, but it's it's got some good moments and uh and it even has a scene with letter uh with uh Littlefield pulling up his pants in it. So. <laughs> and Jay in the closet, of course. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I, I really like the movie. I think it's a lot of fun. Back in the day, um, it was cool because it's it's the house that Larry Larry Sanders lives in too, right? And right. and uh and 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 the fact that it's the same it's the same company um or the same network. Uh, I love I'm a huge channeling fan, huge Larry Sanders fan. Um and they and- they love the late shift and they use stories from the late oh, shift. Absolutely yes, they well. Yeah, they sure did. Were you no Morty was in it. You weren't in it, were you? I was not in it, but they weren't in it. But uh, they used to tell me we're shamelessly ripping you off. Okay, okay. Um, I want to talk about uh, Helen Kushnick a little bit. Yeah, if that's okay. Um, because in your acknowledgments in Late Shift, uh, you know, classy beyond measure. Uh, in the way that, um. You know, you, you talked about her and, and how she treated you during the writing process. Yep. Uh, afterwards, um, you know, sometimes uh, I don't know if there's somebody who who who, who uh, could. It seems like from all accounts, not just your accounts, you were actually very fair with Helen as well. But you I, told it like it I, is. I, I, it was interesting because when Helen's Helen's stepchildren. OK, so Jerry Kushnick had two daughters. Yeah. She cut them out of their lives. They were not allowed to go to uh, their grandmother's funeral. Uh, when they showed up for their father's funeral, she slapped one of them across the face. Yeah. Uh, she was beastly to those young women. And they said, listen, I know people are saying you were rough on Helen. You could not have been kinder to her than what she really was like. They were so over the top. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't know all that stuff when I was writing the book. I'm not sure I would have gotten into it, but obviously uh i am very sympathetic you know so helen was a troubled person she had uh a unbelievably brutal thing happen to her yes uh because she had she gave birth to twins and they had needed a blood tr- transfusion the male twin got aids and died that is yes. horrific beyond description okay yeah yep. so yep. i had great great empathy for her for that but listen you you could not talk to anyone in that show, anybody involved in that whole process without hearing horror stories, horror stories, including Jay. I mean, Jay eventually came around to this incredible you know, epiphany about yeah. how she had run roughshod over, and particularly, you know, the story of, of her planting. Uh, Car- the uh, the, the, yeah, the post. original seed, the right. original seed, putting right. that story she, in the, yeah. She planted the story and... Johnny accused them of that. And Jay said, no, we didn't do it. And she swears we didn't do it. And Johnny didn't believe it. And Jay was like, later on, you know, I lied to Johnny because you you did this. And she then sues the publisher saying that didn't happen, that she didn't plant it, right? It it was so obvious. I mean, Jay, she told Jay it happened. And I had the person who planted it. Tell, tell me about it. So it was there you completely go. ridiculous. But yeah. she... But that's kind of she was just an a person full of rage, full of rage. But during the process of writing the book, I went to dinner with her once. She wouldn't let me tape her, so I could only take notes 
after, like she ran to the ladies' room. I took some notes. I, you know, I, I used a little bit of that. But yeah. later, she called me every time when a new show came on, when Dave came on, when Chevy Chase came on. Yeah, she called me. You know, let's talk about this. And she never said off the record. Never ever said off the record. Never. So I'm like, this is on the record, babe. I'm, you know, yeah. and I still was fair to her. Fair. I would. You, you know, were. Whatever she was saying, I, you know, I, I wouldn't go over the top with her ridiculous cursing. She was incredible with that. But my point is, I was not out to get her. I, I but I, you had to like portray this Svengali like figure in Jay's life and how she drove all the action. She basically pushed NBC to force Johnny out. I mean, it was it was huge. And I basically said, and Jay had every reason. To kind of believe in her because she got that show for him. Okay, she did. She got that show for him. They had no business pushing Letterman out. Letterman you are leading me to my question here. Yeah, this is the. I have to. I have to stop you and I have to ask this question. Um, you look at Leno's ambition in the War for Late Night and who he became. Yeah, when it came to the 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 the, the I want to be on TV. Uh, right. I'm gonna make sure I you know, hold steady and keep my place. If not even be aggressive to stay on TV. Uh, I'm going to, I want my spot and I'm going to protect my spot. Do you think he got any of that behavior from Helen? No, that was, that's all Jay. That's, that's all Jay. Jay right from the, okay. Okay. Jay, that's, Jay was an ambitious guy. He wanted that show. There's no doubt he wanted that show. Okay. And, and, his career was was teetering until Dave saved him. Dave saved him, put him on, and he became a big player. Absolutely, as a guest for Dave. Guest for Dave got him the regular spot as the substitute host for Johnny. That all yeah. happened, but he had no business getting that show because Dave had done all the work to get the yes. show. He just yes. wouldn't. Any sane manager would have said one in one of Dave's contracts. And by the way. Dave gets the show, or there's a fifty million dollar penalty. You want you want to keep Dave? You you guarantee us that show. Dave would never do that because he thought it would offend Johnny. But he that well that worked out for Jay. But you know the way that was set up, he he really had to jump ahead of Dave in the line. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, Dave yeah. was set up to to have that show and wanted the show obviously really badly. So. Okay, so that ambition was there. I mean, the tactics and things like that that Helen. Uh, I think so, uh, and I think Jay. A lot of people think they, Jay wanted to have that person to be the tough person, and she used the line. She said, "You just want me to keep serving you the steaks. You don't want to know how I'm slaughtering the cow." That's Helen, and she understood Jay. Jay wanted that. He didn't want to hear about how she was slaughtering the cow. He wanted her to slaughter the cow. <laughs> he just didn't yeah. want to hear about it. Anyway, we should talk about a Sally because then I got to go. Okay, yeah. Thank you very, very much for this. And okay, what one other little thing? Joan Rivers was also a part of that as well, um, and 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 her exit and all that. We could probably, you know, what we'll we'll table that yeah. for another day when you come on. Joan, Joan was Rivers off part. before before any of that happened. She went to Fox, and then they had to get a different substitute host. You know, because she'd been the regular substitute host. Yeah. For Joan. And they got, interestingly, they got Jay and they had another person lined up to do it every other week. Gary Shandling. Yeah, absolutely. And Shandling then said, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not doing that. No. Yeah. Um, Peter LaSalle, thank you very much for this. Because Peter LaSalle, like, again, uh, I, I have you talked to Peter lately? Not in a while. I'm not since his illness. Has he been? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, from all accounts. Um, you know, the uncle you always wish that you had, um, the guy who, uh, just the kindness, uh, he and Alice, Peter LaSalle is just, uh, I, I, I you know, I, talk a little bit about Peter LaSalle, if you wouldn't mind, because you have a pretty deep relationship with him, d Dot. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. you know, again, a person I didn't know. And then when I encountered him, he was already at Dave's show. It had left Johnny's show yeah. and was at Dave's 1230 show, right. Yeah. With Morty. And so he was in the whole strategizing about getting the Tonight Show and obviously believed that would happen because he wanted to move back to L.A. He didn't want him to live in New York. He right. and Alice did not like New York. So we just started talking and, uh, you know, he just struck me as this incredibly cultured and sophisticated man. Uh, 
who had this in, enormous history in broadcasting. Go back to Arthur Godfrey. Uh, so we, you know, we just hit it off. We we talked a lot, and then, you know, I met Alice, and we went to dinner, and uh, you know, he was enormously helpful to me, enormously helpful to me. And then we stayed very friendly, and every time I went to LA, we'd have dinner. Every time we'd always arrange to have dinner, usually at Medeo restaurant and uh or one of Wolfgang Puck's place because they were friendly with all the chefs you know yeah. um but occasionally at their house and they had two houses one in Malibu anyway just a super human being uh, you know with a personal story that he didn't tell but a, an amazing story uh you know he had a number on his arm you know from yeah. a concentration camp I mean yeah. amazing stuff to be that appreciative of comedy is what I, I always used to think this is an amazing thing. You know, he, his personal story is so traumatic. It should be, but the guy is really a sophisticated person about comedy. Yeah. And he, you know, he really got everybody. He got Dave so well, you know, he got Dave and he got Jay. He so got Jay, you know, he just so got him. And Johnny, you know, who he, had a long-standing relationship. He was very straightforward and honest about Johnny too, you know, and and they were close with Johnny and Johnny's last wife, and then that fell apart. So he had all these angles for me to talk to him about, a million angles. And we'd always talk about some late the new late night person. He was always looking for talent in late night. He he had a, a great sense of who would work. Like he knew, he saw Dave and he knew that guy's a late night host. That guy. He was Dave hosted after only, I don't know. Four appearance, some very limited number of ridiculously fast. Yep. Yes, hosting. You know, and they were immediately like, oh boy, is he got it because he was so comfortable as a broadcaster. Yeah. So um I just think the world of Peter LaSalle. And uh, you know, of course, I'm sorry that Alice is gone. And I know Peter had a stroke, so I hope somehow he's getting by. What have you yeah. talked to him? I haven't. I haven't. He's uh he he was in the top five. I have a top five dream list. Um, yeah, and, and he's he's on it. By the way, so, well, so I, so I, I sometimes talk to uh, Debbie Vickers, uh, who's yeah. uh, Jay's longtime executive producer, and another yes. absolutely wonderful human being. Uh, and she and Peter are very, very close, very, very close. And uh, so she gave me a few updates for a while, but I have not heard from her in some time. But we had her on the uh, on the late night documentary series, which I did for CNN which I recommend. And it was uh, very she, good. The story of late night was very, very good. And she was great in that. And the yep. little story about Debbie, she said, I, I don't want to do this. I'm not good on camera. And I said, I, we need you. And I said, all right, I'll do it for you, Bill. I'll do it for you. And she said, but the only thing is you have to promise you won't make me cry. And I said, I'm not, I, I have no intention of making you cry. I have no intention of making you cry. So we're, <laughs> we're doing the interview. And here's the question I asked her. So tell me about your relationship with Jay. She starts and she starts to cry immediately. <laughs> and she's like, I told, I said, I didn't think that would make you cry. There's not much more of a harmless question than that. But she was caught up already with absolutely all emotion. And it's just, but she's a fabulous, wonderful person. And believe me, a brilliant producer who managed Jay brilliantly, yeah. brilliantly got every ounce of talent out of him. She was really great. So another person I was fortunate to meet along the way. And that's a long, long list, but she's definitely on it. Bill, I, uh, I I'm going to be uh, uh, conscious of your time, despite yeah, the fact I that I do not want to be. Um, I, thank you so much for this. At the beginning of this, we were like, okay, well, how, how long are we going to go? Whatever. Yeah. I can, as you could see, we could well, do this forever. Yeah. Um, we'll start your, yeah. I, I, I please, um, please consider coming back again. I would love to have you back. Um, I've got so many things that I could ask you still. Uh, but at the well, end of the I, day, I've told it all now. I, there's nothing. I, oh yeah, no. <laughs> trust me. No, there, I, there, I, I don't know much more. I just wonder what I'll be doing. I don't know what I'll be doing in the future, but uh, I enjoyed this. So uh, thanks for having me on. Excellent. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, if if somebody wants to follow you. Where, where are your social channels? Where are you? Uh, if people on, want to I'm follow you. Twitter, and keep up? Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, uh, at Bill Carter. And uh, uh, I don't do Facebook. Uh, 
I'm on LinkedIn. I don't really do a lot besides Twitter, okay. but I do a lot. Of, I do a lot of commentary on Twitter where I get a lot of uh, a lot of my shots in. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and as the shingle goes out, uh, please know oh, as sorry. our voice it's at, gets it's bigger. At W J Carter. At W J Carter. At W J Carter. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and. Every, just so you're aware, any project that you will do, we will shout it from the rooftops with what we okay. do. Uh, could not be more respectful of oh, you. Then I will I will add one last thing. Okay. Here, here's the thing. If you do, anyone out there has listened to this and heard all these enormous compliments about The Late Shift. If you want to read The Late Shift, the easiest way is to now get a digital copy because yeah. when the book came out, that did not exist. There were no digital copies. There were no digital books. So only in the last few years has a digital book come out. And fortunately, that is under a different uh, circumstance from the publishing. And I get a little more money out of that. So I prefer oh, there you to go. buy the digital book than, than the... Uh, yeah, so the, so the Which is kind of book. flip-flop from what you'd normally hear. And by oh, the way, the digital because... book has some extra, a little bit of extra stuff in it compared yeah. to the original one. You've you've added oh, yeah. some things to it. So, so I what I... It's, uh, it's by Open Road Media. It's called Open Road Media. The reason that this happened is that my agent managed to go and say to the publisher, you never sold the digital rights. Are you going to do digital rights? And they're like, we're not going to do that now. And they said, well, then she said, well, then can we have them? And they said, okay. So that's it's more of a 50-50 proposition on that. With, with a regular book, it's 15% after yeah. you've sold a zillion copies. So anyway, that's why um, it's and I would recommend if you do want to read, that's the easiest way. So that's perfect. Um, highly recommend. However, you can get your hands on um, uh, the Late Shift, the War for Late Night, and Desperate Networks, by the way, which we didn't even get to, but also a nice little gem. Uh, okay, we'll get to that a in the future. Stuff in um, okay, I'm gonna say thank you right now. I'll shoot a separate outro, and then we'll say a quick goodbye. Okay, so I'm gonna okay. hit stop record. Thank you very much, Bill. I really appreciate you. Okay, I'm. I got. I really got to get to lunch. That's why I got to run. Okay. Okay. Thanks, right. buddy. Okay, bye. Okay, so obviously um, I couldn't just end it there. Uh, I mean, I think it translates as to how much friggin' fun that was. And it was. It was, uh, it was a, a fantastic experience. I'm very, very grateful for it. Thank you to Bill for coming on and being as, as open and earnest as he was. And, and I just... Um, yeah, I appreciate him. And I, I think there's a lot, you know, to, to to borrow a phrase, a lot more to come with Bill. And uh, I, I'm not just saying, I'm, I'm hoping there's more to come with him in this program or or some way that I can interact with him more. Uh, more uh, I was more saying, clearly, there's more to come, whether it is another book, uh, whether it is some sort of a series, whether it is some sort of a, you know, Hopefully something will, will will come. And if anything, um, if more dreams are coming true uh, for the old Mike guy here, uh, I'll be a part of that. I, I mean, uh, picking that guy's brain um, was nothing short of a delight. So that was great. Uh, once again, uh, Letterman Podcast, if you wouldn't mind sharing this, getting people to subscribe a little bit more, you know, we want to get to that place. Again, I don't want to talk. I don't want to, I don't want to have to ask that ever again. So once we get over a certain hump, I'll never have to ask that ever again. Uh, but but please do like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, uh, you know, uh, blow the whistle, whatever, whatever you do to make that happen. Um, and and yes, please join the Letterman Podcast Facebook group uh, because we're going to be giving some stuff away. Once again, thank you to uh, Rupert and May at the Hello Deli. Our one and only sponsor is uh, the Letterman Podcast is the Hello Deli. Thank you to Don Giller for everything that he does. And uh, the other people behind the scenes who um, help shape what it is that we're doing here with this show. I mean, at the end of the day, we're almost a year old. We're just getting started. Uh, we've got a lot more cool things coming out. Uh, keep your uh, keep 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 yourself posted as to what it is that we're doing because we've got some fun things coming. Um, yeah, this has been a very special. They're all special. Um, but this has been yeah. This is one of those episodes. Uh, of uh of the letterman podcast with mike chisholm coincidentally i am mike chisholm thank you and good night overcoat and underpants